These are the Pokemon that took the least amount of time to get banned from OU. The Pokemon that everyone agreed had to go. Ever since it was discovered that Mewtwo destroyed pretty much everything, bans have been an integral part of competitive Pokemon. They are an attempt to make a balanced, skill-conducive metagame out of what would otherwise be chaos. Of course, deciding whether or not a Pokemon is broken is a subject to much scrutiny and disagreement, even among the most experienced players. Even Pokemon that seem obviously broken beyond belief have a surprise surprising tendency to stick around for what in hindsight seems like a ludicrous amount of time. To this day, it is a wonder how Genesect wasn't instantly axed from Gen 5 OU or Faramosa from Gen 7 OU, let alone the agonizing long period of several months they terrorized the tier before finally getting the boot. And even as they were finally getting banned, there were players willing to die on the hill that they were a perfectly reasonable threat to have running around. However, these Pokemon we're going over today so decisively shattered this delusion that they were subject to to a quick ban as opposed to a regular ban. If the famously fickle competitive community could universally agree on the most divisive of topics, it speaks to the stunning level of brokenness these mons were at. But wait, you're wondering, how exactly does a quick ban distinguish itself from a regular ban? Sure, the name implies the ban is faster than other bans, but how is this decided? Well, usually Pokemon are banned through suspect tests, in which players can qualify to vote. This process takes quite some time. Quick bans, on the other hand, are done by those in charge of the tiering system of their respective metagames. Such players keep their eyes on the health of the metagame as well as the thoughts of the community at large in regards to potentially problematic elements. This is how candidates for suspect tests like Gen 6 Hoopa Unbound or Gen 8 Spectrier are chosen. Quick vans are essentially a hyper expedited version of this process, minus the voting part. They are reserved for Pokemon who reveal themselves to be so universally broken that the community at large agrees there's no debate to be had and there's no need to waste time with a vote that would let the Pokemon at hand destroy the tier further. Just get rid of it. At that time, those in charge of the tiering simply make the decision that these Pokemon must be removed and removed instantly. Quick bans are usually at the beginning of a generation or when a new element is added to the tier. For example, Gen 7 Naga Nadel. However, even some quick bans take some time to be enacted, relatively speaking anyway. We'll mention those later for further context. Now let's look at the Pokemon that have lasted the shortest time in OU. But first, protect yourself from getting quick banned thanks to this video sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Surfshark is a virtual private network app and browser extension that allows you to place your computer or phone virtually in any country as if you're actually there. Surfshark has 3,200 plus servers in over 65 countries. And of course, being a VPN not only gives you protection from random lurkers on shady public Wi-Fis that you're probably connecting to while on holiday vacation, but it also bypasses the limits of these connections as well. For example, when I travel, I literally can't fit my big editing PC in my suitcase, so I often use a less powerful laptop with a remote desktop app to edit on. There have been times where the hotel Wi-Fi blocks my remote desktop app from connecting to my own computer at home for reasons. But by using a VPN like Surfshark, that is no longer an issue. And sometimes I just want to watch more holiday content and a lot of it happens to be region locked, but that's also no longer an issue. Just hit this button and boom, more content on your preferred streaming service. So if you want a sick VPN and also support the channel to help us produce more content, you can use my promo code FALSEWIPE or click the link in the description below and get Surfshark VPN for 83% off and 3 extra months for free. In early Sun and Moon, Aegislash made a controversial yet fortuitous brief return to OU. It was arguably the single most despised Pokemon from X and Y OU, broken almost fundamentally with its absurd effective base stat total, enabled by the ridiculousness of one of the most insane moves in the game, King Shield, as well as an astonishingly good typing. Thanks to new toy syndrome or current gen blindness, whichever turn you prefer for the phenomenon where newly added Pokemon take forever to get banned even when they're clearly broken, it took a monumental effort for Aegislash to even get tested, let alone banned. Once the dust settled, however, and everyone saw just how much better the metagame was for not having Aegislash in it, it became clear. This was one of the most monstrous threats to ever be unleashed in an OU tier, packing an unrelenting stranglehold over nearly everything in the game. Nothing quite like a nearly unstoppable offensive monster that also resisted almost everything, devoured neutral hits as well, and even effortlessly survived the few mines that hit it super effectively. Even those 
as strong as Mamoswine Stab Earthquake. When Oraz came around, Age of Slash was briefly retested, but the idea was universally panned as a waste of time. The player base panicked over the idea of having it come back to OU and ensured it didn't return with a resounding super majority vote to keep it banned. In a similar vein, when the initial Sun and Moon ban lists were chosen, the player base begged Age of Slash to be on it. Let us not waste our time, they said. With this Pokemon, we know will be broken. Yet Age of Slash was unleashed and proceeded to wreak havoc on OU yet again. With Gen 7's influx of fairies, Age of Slash had an even easier time switching in than it had before. It was one of the few Pokemon not completely terrified of Tapu Lele's stab combination in conjunction with Focus Blast, and was just as terrifying an offensive force itself as it was before. Arguably more so, since it had so many more opportunities to fire its attacks off, hit so many other new Pokemon super effectively, and could make itself even more powerful with Z moves. The argument that Age of Slash didn't actually hit that hard with Shadow Ball as its stab had always been a poor one, given just how high its special attack was and the move's great neutral coverage. But now, boosted with Never Ending Nightmare, it was an even more efficient KO machine. A KO machine impossible to KO itself. Indeed, dealing with Age of Slash was even more irritating now thanks to new terrains, mostly Tapu Bulu's. Not only did Grassy Terrain give it passive recovery, letting it stick around even more easily, but it even halved the damage of Earthquake, making defeating Age of Slash an even more impossible task. Additionally, Tapu Fini's Misty Terrain protected Age of Slash from potential burns. Right from day one of Gen 7, the player base began to complain that Age of Slash was once again doing what they knew it would do and that it was too much. Around a week later, enough was enough, though it could be argued to have been too much to begin with, Age of Slash was quick banned, having left a massive destruction in his wake even in this limited time. While Age of Slash lasted about a week and a day, our next three Pokemon lasted a week exactly. The first two both used their incredible water type power to drown everything in their path. It's the Scarlet and Violet duel of Palafin and Iron Bundle. Both were fast, especially Iron Bundle, who was one of the fastest Pokemon in the game, and monstrously strong. Delibird packed a vicious secondary stab in Ice Beam that complemented its powerful Hydro Pumps perfectly by destroying the grass and dragon types that would resist it, while Palafin's Hero Form packed a staggering 160 base attack, much stronger than that of Groudon or Rayquaza for reference, and a powerful stab priority move in Jet Punch. Though they were naturally excellent, what arguably pushed them over the edge was just how insane they were at abusing terrestrialization. Iron Bundle terrestrializing water made its Hydro Pumps absolutely obscene and removed the defensive downsides of its ice typing. Palafin could terrestrialize water as well, which made its choice band set similarly absurd, but also terrestrialized fire on a nearly unstoppable bulk upset. Between its superb bulk and boosted drain punches, it cleaved through the metagame effortlessly. The two Pokemon were banned simultaneously, providing the player base the reprieve they had been begging for. Speaking of cleaving through the metagame effortlessly, this brings us to our third Pokemon that lasted a week, Mega Salamence in Oras. With its insane speed and huge attack boosted further by Aerolate and its enormous defense stat making it even harder to take down, it's such a comically overpowered Pokemon, it would certainly not have been allowed anywhere but its debut generation. And even then, it's the kind of Pokemon quick bands were made for. With the excellence of flying coverage as an attacking stab, Mega Mints ripped through the metagame with a variety of different sets, with a mix of Substitute, Refresh, Roost, Fire Blast, and Earthquake, making it even nastier to deal with, as if the sheer power of its returns or double edges, taken even further by Dragon Dance, didn't bowl everything over already. The player base was clamoring to ban Mega Mints on the first day of Oras, and on the seventh day, Arceus created the Salamensite ban. Upon the release of Crown Tundra, there was a broken duel that didn't even last a full seven days. By some inexplicable act of Arceus, Genesect had avoided a quick ban in Generation 6 and 7, despite only getting better. You couldn't even blame New Toy Syndrome anymore, leaving one to look upwards and ask why, only to be met with maddening silence as the unholy metal bug proceeded to ravage the OU metagame. However, it was apparently the fourth time around that the player base learned their lesson, which was interesting since Genesect actually downgraded from Gen 7 
7 to Gen 8. It lost out on Hidden Power Ground and Z moves, and the fact that everything ran Heavy Duty Boots meant its U-turns wouldn't be backed by Hazard Crusher as reliably. In spite of this, Genesect so thoroughly destroyed Generation 8. It was as if it was on a mission to finally achieve the Quick Band status that had eluded it for so long. While it had to equip a Douse Drive to hit Heat Ran now, turns out that that wasn't too bad of a restriction. Its Techno Blast utterly crushed Heat Ran, as well as Moltres and Volcarona, making it a generally great coverage attack. And if your Fire type couldn't check Genesect, you were dead meat. Nothing else came close to answering it at all. The other half of this duo was Naga Nadel. It had actually already racked up a quick ban for itself upon its introduction in Ultra Sun and Moon, but took about a week and a half, thus precluding it from this list. It returned with a vengeance in Generation 8. Though it too lamented its loss of Z-moves, it remained a fundamentally absurd Pokemon. It packed a ferocious stab combination with fairy immunities to its Draco Meteor not wanting to come anywhere near its Sludge Wave. The combination was bolstered by fire coverage, roasting every non-Heat Ran Steel type that would otherwise resist both. These attacks already came off an incredible base 127 special attack and were bolstered to ludicrous levels by Nasty Plot. What made Naga Nadel particularly terrifying was its amazing base speed of base 121, the same as Tornadus Therian, which made it instantaneously threatening to so many Pokemon. And with Beast Boost, it would gain plus one speed upon KOing something, so it could very easily snowball out of control. Its high speed meant it beat pretty much every non Ditto Scarfer at plus one. Plus, as a bonus, Naga Naganadel gained spikes in Generation 8, as if it wasn't tough enough to deal with already. Dealing with Naganadel was incredibly limited to the point of being unreasonable, and as a result, it and Genesect were removed for the good of OU less than a week into Crown Tundra OU's existence. Get a purge going! Live a little! Because in one week's time... <laughs> well, to give you an idea... It's a shame we never got Pokemon Z version, as one can only imagine the fascinating lore and breathtaking spectacles Zygarde Complete would have brought in the game. This is the rare case of an imposing appearance very much matching the Pokemon's corresponding competitive capability. Zygarde Complete in the early days of Sun and Moon is one of the most godforsaking abominations ever unleashed in OU. In addition to how unbelievably overwhelming it was, it also presents a departure from the other Pokemon on this list. They are all impossible to stop offensively. Zygarde Complete also is, but in a very different way. It only packs base 100 attack, which is downright meager at times, especially by Gen 7 standards. Yeah, it has an amazing effect on its stab, Thousand Arrows, and Dragon Stab is good, and Extreme Speed is an amazing move, but it's not that strong. What distinguishes Zygarde Complete from the other Pokemon on this list, except for maybe Aegislash, is the fact that it is impossible to kill, in ways that makes even Aegislash look quaint. With the Power Construct ability, once base Zygarde hits 50% HP, it transforms into Zygarde Complete, which packs a staggering 216 base HP. This is the fourth highest in the entire game behind Blissey, Chansey, and Guzzlord. Now, Guzzlord's miserable defense stats prove that a high HP stat alone doesn't make for a bulky Pokemon. However, with Zygarde's fantastic combination of base 121 defense and 95 speed, it becomes the overall bulkiest Pokemon ever allowed outside of ubers its bulk can only be described with superlatives that's what makes it impossible to stop offensively not that it hits fast and hard but the fact that counterattacks don't stop it letting it beat pretty much everything offensively just how bulky is zygarde complete while well, surviving a super effective life orb latios draco meteor was fairly easy for it so yeah everything else was a piece of cake. It survived Protean Greninja's Ice Beam, Tapu Koko's Choice Specs Hidden Power Ice wasn't a guaranteed 2 at KO, Landorant's and Karna's Life Orb Sheer Force Earth Power, one of the strongest special attacks in the game, wasn't a guaranteed 3 hit KO, Clefable's Moonblast was a guaranteed 4 hit KO, and we'll stop before we get carried away. But yeah, it was utterly ridiculous. You couldn't out-offense Zygarde complete. You could only out-stall it, a la GSC Snorlax. As a result, it lasted around 4 days before it it was sent packing to another tier it would excel in. If you've been following the early Scarlet and Violet OU metagame, you've witnessed history. The bands of Houndstone and Fluttermane are the fastest 
any Pokemon has ever been banned from OU. Both contributed to the long-standing tradition of powerful ghost types. With the move Last Respects, Houndstone packed an insanely powerful stab move that got stronger with each teammate it lost. If it was the last Pokemon standing, Last Respects came in at a mind-boggling 300 base power. It was an automatic KO machine, especially with Terrastalizing Ghosts to boost the move even further. It makes Ultra Necrozma's light that burns in the sky look like the type of move you find in Yu Yu by comparison. With Sand Rush, Houndstone had no problem outspeeding everything too. Well, how do you get it to that last Pokemon scenario? Why, by sacrificing your own Pokemon, of course. Plenty of teams employed Memento for this purpose. That was the worst battle in Pokemon history. Not the 4x Memento into 20%. Houndstone wasn't just officially the scariest sand rusher of all time either. Although to make Gen 5 Extra Joe look bad in comparison is quite a feat. It could also run the Fluffy ability to make its defense stat go through the roof. Fluffy doesn't make body press stronger, but the move still hit hard and was especially useful for destroying dark types, making it even easier for Houndstone to spam last respects. Plus, Houndstone could boost body press even further by terrestrializing fighting, which also had the benefit of turning its dark weakness into a resistance. Alternatively, Houndstone could remove the dark weakness by terrestrializing normal, which made it immune to ghosts itself. This helped against other Houndstone and the Pokemon it was banned alongside, Fluttermane. Fluttermane had incredible speed and monstrous power to begin with, making it easy to spawn its excellent stab combination of Moonblast and Shadow Ball, and it could easily make itself faster and stronger. With booster energy, it received a speed boost not copied by Scarf Ditto, so even the ultimate failsafe would speed tie it. Furthermore, Fluttermane was so fast that at plus one, it would outrun every Scarfer with ease. It could also go for specs, making it the most immediately fast, powerful Pokemon around, or it could go for one of many Calm Mind sets to gain power while being able to switch between its many phenomenal moves. It also had all the coverage it could ask for. Mystical Fire had great synergy with the stabs while it could shatter Claude Sire with Psystrock. Of course, Terrastalizing made Fluttermane even more of an obscene threat. It could boost either one of its stabs to staggering levels, or it could Terrastalize Steel, allowing it to resist would-be super effective bullet punches from Scizor and make it rains from Scarf Golden Go. Houndstone and Fluttermane were instantly met with demands for bans from the player base. Demands which were met faster than any anything else in competitive Pokemon history. There have been, of course, many other quick bans since Generation 6. We mentioned Nagana Dell and Ultra Sun and Moon, for example, which was quite fast, but even the first quick ban in XY, Blaziken and Deoxys Normal, took nearly a month, which is downright slow in comparison to those that we've highlighted here, to say nothing of the Mega Gengar and Mega Kangaskhan bans that would follow some time after. We also have only touched upon OU here. The lower tiers have quick banned many Pokemon in their time, and even Mega Rayquaza famously got quick banned from Ubers in a similar time span to those that we have highlighted here. If there were any Pokemon that weren't quick banned but you think deserved it, let us know in the comments. Otherwise, we'll see you next time, perhaps when Game Freak unleashes some more absurdly broken quick ban worthy monsters. Thanks for watching, everyone. And as always, if you liked the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False Swipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content. And thank you so much to our patrons for continued support of our videos. And thank you to everyone else watching as well. and follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you next time, everyone.